I'm Scott Perkins from The Bearded Butchers, and we're picking up here after the breakdown, and we're going to go through our trimmings pile, and we're going to be showing you how we work through our trimming to get our ground beef. For you uh, Europeans, your minced meats, really important that we spend a little bit of time talking about this because generally speaking, about 50% of what you get off of your carcass turns into your ground beef. So today, we're going to be showing you what you need to do to turn out some awesome ground beef. First thing I'm gonna start with is this plate we've gone ahead and cut through the soft portion of the bone. And so what we're gonna be doing here is we're gonna be taking a lot of the, this boils down to how much fat you wanna leave in for your trimmings. And when we're dealing with whole animal butchery, we don't necessarily have a science here where we're going to get to say like a, an 80, 20, 90, 10, that sort of thing. What I like to do is just stay close to the bone when I'm taking my trimmings off of here. Work, work the angles. Anytime you're working around soft bone, you wanna look and make sure that if you have a sharp knife and it gets into the soft portion of the bone that you don't put that into your trimmings. So on a carcass, say for example, this carcass, which was 320 pounds, when it came down to it, you're gonna be looking at about 60, 65% yield in terms of boneless meat off of your carcass. And so here in the Americas, North America, Typically when we have a 60% yield, say off of a 300 pound carcass, roughly 210 pounds, we're going to have, or 65% yield, we're going to have about 100 pounds of trimming. So if we have something like this, what I like to do is cut it in maybe three strips, about so wide. And what that allows me to do is then take and work each strip one piece at a time. So if I were to cut it in half and say something like this, if I have what I consider be a little too much fat, um, I can just take my knife and, and work, work that fat off of, the, off of there. Now once I've done that, um, there's a piece of that soft bone that I want to get rid of. And then of course the, the muscle is something that I want to put in my tub for now, depending on your grinder size, this kind of dictates where you're going to, how large your pieces can be. Um, for something like us here at the shop, we have a grinder that's capable of about the size of your fist. So I can make these pretty, pretty decent size. Now at home, depending on what size grinder you've had, I've figured out that generally speaking, a lot of times, something that's roughly the size of a golf ball or a ping pong ball tends to work out pretty well. Now this, this part of the process is generally the more mundane portion, the area that you <clears throat> maybe don't have as much fun with. However, this is a really important part because you have so much to work with. Something like this will just zip it up into several pieces. Now on the plate here, what we can do is we can find any areas that we didn't get right against the bone. And what I like to do is just start working down through each piece individually and work the, work the meat. If you have a rib or something like that, you're going to want to just slide your knife down in between it, separate the rib, and then trim each piece up 
a little bit further as you go. Now, like I mentioned before, we've been called out a little bit on our butchering because we turn so much into the ground meats. Now, we know the European cutting styles differ from ours. However, we as Americans have perfected the, the art of the hamburger, so it really makes a lot of sense for us to do a lot of this into the ground meats. Now, this area, you can, you can spend just about an untold amount of time trimming your trimmings pile, going through it, and how particular you become, I guess, depends on how much time you want to spend on it. Here at our shop, all of our bones get used for, for soup stocks. So this, um, this is something that we can put in our stockpile and that's going to be used. Now moving on to the short ribs, this is where we have one of our larger pieces. What I like to do is I, I stand this up on, on edge just like so and then do it an inverted grip and just stay right along the rib. You can trim, trim it down and then turn your knife over and keep working it down. And one of the things that I like to do is just stay right along the bone and that allows me to first take the meat all the way down to the bone and then work at the trimming from there. So for example, I'm not necessarily working from the outside into the bone, I'm working from right against the bone out. So once we've done that, I can take and I can work using this standing right up on the table like so, I work down between each rib. First one side and then the other staying right against the rib. One thing we don't like to do is take meat off the table and work on it up here. That's too dangerous, it's inefficient, and it'll lead to a really bad habit that will get you hurt sooner or later. So talking about percentage of fat, you see this in the grocery store all the time. Something is 90-10, 80-20, 85-15, so on. Whole animal butchery differs because you're literally taking whatever this animal had in terms of fat and leaving a portion of it onto the carcass, or excuse me, in your trimming. So if you want a leaner grind, then you simply have to take more fat out of the carcass. Now some of that depends on how fat the animal started out, how lean the animal was. On these short ribs you have to look and make sure you don't have a, a bit of a soft bone in there and then once again we're going to cut these into strips. Now we do cut a lot of short ribs here at the shop but generally this this does go into the ground meats. It makes a really wonderful grind. Now you'll find as you work through your ground meats, you do not want to grind just the front portion or the chuck of the animal separate from the hind unless you are specifically looking for more fat in the front portion. Whenever you do your grinding, you want a mixture of both. Now we'll work on this beef shank. Here's an area where you want it just stay right along the bone as much as you can. Pull this off in chunks. You're gonna find that you're gonna have a bit more tendon to deal with with your, with your shank than you would on some of the different areas. So A lot of times you can pull one end up towards yourself and the other end just leave on the table. We like this six inch semi-stiff Victorinox boning knife because it allows us to get all those different angles and 
really work the, the muscles away from the bone. So with something like this, you've got this tendon at the end. You're going to want to get the tendon out of both ends. What I like to do is just start peeling it down, get it separated from the, the muscle on both sides. Now here at our shop, everything we do gets recycled. If not used for human food, we don't want anything to go to waste. So if we have the cartilage and tendons, if it's not going into a bone broth, that's going to go into our, our line of pet food. So we're looking for this white cordage. I'm going to separate out of here any blood vessels that we have. Once we've got to this point, what we're simply not going to be able to do is remove every single bit of connective tissue or tendon. I like it at this point, so what we'll do is we'll cut it into something like those fist size pieces and we'll move on to the next piece. Here we have the ribs off the chuck. Once again, staying just against the bone. I'll peel this back. Here you can make a boneless rib. In this case, we're gonna be doing our grindings. Here I'm using the flex of the knife actually putting downward pressure pressure on my handle as I rotate my wrist and make a 90 degree turn to come out of there. Then I can simply, sometimes you're gonna find that you wanna turn a piece first one way and then the other way. That allows you to get the advantage of the angle as we work down through here. Just staying real nice and tight along that bone. Sometimes using my supporting hand just to keep the muscle from falling away as I remove what attaches it to the bone. The other important thing to point out is as you're working on the trimmings and the grindings and that sort of thing, it's, um, it's really great if you're working with the chilled meat versus uh, non-chilled. When we, we talk about the meat being set up, that happens a lot with our dry aging where the tenderness, or excuse me, the the meat is set up and it's become sort of firm. So as you work through it, you're not having it slide around. This is also important for the grinding too. So that way when you, when you go ahead and do your grinding, your fats don't smear. Now that we have that part done, this can just be chunked up into various size pieces. Once again, kind of comes down to your preference on how much fat you want to leave in or take out. Now in this case here, I found some silver skin and Seth demonstrates a lot. We want to use that fish fillet method where we move right over the edge of the table. Sometimes you'll actually want to just tuck your fingers back and hold it down with your fist onto your, onto your surface. You can see today I'm working on wood. Um, wood or poly works really well. And we're moving right along. You 
Nothing real showy about this part of the job. Just kind of the put on your boots and get the job done type. It is very important that your all your hard work really does pay off in this portion of it. As we work down through each rib here, we want to Sometimes I'll work down through them once and then I'll just kind of go, go at it from a different angle. Make sure that when we did our initial breakdown, any areas that weren't quite cleaned up enough. And I know I'll probably get called out on the um, fact that somebody will say that they spend more time doing a better job. And you know, that's fine. Um, for the sake of what we do here, we break, um, not uncommon for us to do five or six beef or bison sides in a single day. And like mentioned, everything goes into a soup stock or the bones or whatever. Now this rib here, instead of standing it up, I'm just gonna keep it flat. I'm gonna use my hand, just kinda, my supporting hand just to, to, to put some pressure down. And that's gonna roll it up as I work. And I can go down, once again, staying right along the rib. Now we found that for us, the best setup, we, we do a double grind. We first grind through a coarse grinder and that pushes right into a fine grinder. We, uh, we found that that gives us a really nice tender bite with our ground meats. And that's what we like to do here in our shop. Now I just know from experience there's gonna be a little bit of a tendon in this end, some blood vessels, so just following this natural seam, I'll pull the muscle out. Pull the muscle off the top and you can see I'm exposing that, that blood vessel that I do not want to put in my, so here again, I'll use the method of just cutting it into three pieces. What this allows me to do then is use the fish fillet method, pull a little of this extra fat out of here. And some of you may be thinking that you would just leave that in there and that's fine. I, some people like the fat, we just know that from experience that our customers prefer something what we would we might call the the 90 10 with not a lot of fat in it so some of these areas especially if i know that the fat houses a, a gland or two as well as the blood vessels i'm going to go ahead and pull those out get them removed my last piece with the bone actually still in it is this shoulder blade so i'm going to use i'm actually going to use my body to support this, keep it from sliding away. Once again, I'm using the flex. You can see my knife there being as a semi flex allows me to use the pressure, the downward pressure to, to actually get into that, that concave of that bone. You can see it just pulls it right out. I can push that down into my trimmings, flip it over, use my free hand to sort of pull away on the muscle. Sometimes you might find yourself wanting to tip up just like so. It's kind of whatever, whatever works best in your application. Now this is the, these are the boneless trimmings left over from the initial breakdown. Um, here we have to look for this heavy yellow white cordage connective tissue. We're gonna go ahead and get that removed out of there. Any tubular veins or blood vessels we wanna remove. It's also wise as you work down through it, by removing the large chunks of fat, you will um, just in essence catch the glands too because they're always located or embedded in the fat so 
kind of a hidden side benefit of not leaving large chunks of fat in is that you remove any glands, unwanted glands. We've found it helpful that the use of various angles in the meat business is really the difference maker. A lot of that just comes with experience. You learn over time. Here's our neck roll. Um, Seth removed the bone from the neck. It's quite a mess right now, but we're gonna get it cleaned up. First thing we're gonna do on this end, you have a, a large chunk of fat, and in that, it's one of those large glands that I just spoke of. So by taking that fat out of there, we've snagged that gland as well. Then on the bottom of your neck, you're gonna have sort of your, your bloody neck meat, your, your throat. We like to get that off of there. We don't want that going into our ground beef. That would be much better served for, for pet food. So I'm just gonna work that down. Expose that. that vein. And I can just work a lot of that, those nasty bits right out of there. See, by just doing that, I've cleaned up quite a bit. I can come on down and here again is where we're gonna find some of the, the glands. Really the neck is kind of the, the worst part for the glands and the, and the blood vessels. Then you'll have a bit of this yellow cord. You'll wanna remove out of there. This can go into your soup your bones for your soup stock. This yellow cord can. That'll render down into some wonderful soup stock. At this point, I've got my neck trimmed up quite well. Now, we've not really addressed the stew meat in the grind, in the in the trimming portion, simply because that got addressed in the breakdown. Um, some of you would use the neck for stew. In this case, we're just going to add it to our trimmings. At this point, I can take it, and being its neck, it's a bit tougher, but I can cut it into strips. Chunks about the size of my fist. Each piece has a little bit different angle, a little bit different anatomy that we work through, but little by little we work further breaking down each muscle until we have removed every bit of excess fat and gristle that we don't want in our trimmings. Now you will find as you move through your trimmings just what came down off of the carcass breakdown. Some of the stuff needs no further trimming. It can just be simply straight from the carcass if it's a smaller strip or something that was previously trimmed during the breakdown. We found that the best method, unless you have two people working at the same time where one person can work on the trimmings, which is generally what we do, it's best to do the full breakdown, put your trimmings aside, and just come back to them after you've got your breakdown. Otherwise, you just won't be able to stay on top of things.
All right, there you have it. Our beautiful pile of trimmings all removed. Uh, we've removed all the nasty bits, the things you wouldn't want, your um, excess fat, some of the blood vessels, glands. That's gonna go into pet food. Um, we have a tub of the bones here that we're gonna make into a wonderful soup stock. And this has been how to do the, the trimmings. And we wanna remind you to subscribe to stay up to date on more videos that we have coming in the future. I'm Scott Perkins from The Beard of Butchers and we'll see you next time.